Ooh, I love Ghost Charm. What's up guys, it's me, Ghost, your host as always, and today I want to welcome you to a video that is sure to be completely and utterly different from pretty much everything ever uploaded to this channel, period. Because today, for the very first time, there is absolutely no script, and really no concrete plan either. I mean, I'm in my underwear, the window's open, I'm using my backup microphone, I'm not concerned with audio quality and the typical polish of a normal upload. I want to very organically and honestly sit down and talk with you guys about these initial 19 villains that we have covered in the Villainpedia series on this channel. Because believe it or not, boy, we are quickly approaching the three-year anniversary of the very first upload of any Villainpedia entry in the history of Earth, my video on Dagoth Earth. And man, that is just crazy. Time flies, and it's so cool to see how that video and then this series really took my channel from nothing, just a little hobby, all the way to what it is now, approaching 200,000 subscribers. And I mean, you guys are the best fans like on the internet. You're so loyal, you're so kind to me and to each other. Just a wonderful community, man. I can't say enough positive things about you all, so thank you. But to be honest, after the most recent Villainpedia entry on Frank Horrigan, I kind of felt like season one, if you will, of the Villainpedia was complete. Now, I know that there's tons of big-scale villains I've mentioned and wanted to make videos on that haven't been covered yet, but these first 19, for whatever reason, I was really excited about. These are the ones that jumped into my brain based on what I was playing at the time and the things I was passionate about in regards to storytelling and video games at large. And now it feels like an opportunity to kind of reset and enter a new frontier, replay some games, play some new games, you know, get to know some of these iconic villains that I'm not as familiar with. And what better way to do that than to take a healthy look back at the original 19 and try to sort them in one of my favorite things on the internet, a classic tier list, baby. Now, maybe you don't like tier lists. Maybe you don't like videos like this. That's fine, man. Don't worry. We're going to resume the normal types of content on this channel right after this. But I just really wanted to sit down and do this with you guys. And it also gives me an opportunity to break down that sort of theatrical barrier between me, the videos, and you guys, the audience watching at home. So just kind of hear me candidly talk and hang out. So without further ado, let's get this cookie crumbling, man. So the criteria for my rankings is pretty straightforward and also maybe like a little nebulous. So I don't care to rank them based on objective evil. That's kind of boring. That's not the point. Now, if you've watched the videos, you would know that what interests me the most is which makes for the best video game villain specifically. Which is a whole lot of stuff, right? It's interactivity, it's the boss fight, if there is one, there's like, how badly do you want to get through the game to get to that person and conquer them in whatever way? What's the scale of their evil? How's the backstory? Are they a sympathetic villain, a tragic villain? It's all personal preference too, so I'm gonna put the link for this tier maker down below and you can tell me I'm wrong, you can make your own, whatever you want to do, man. Y y whatever you want to do, okay? First off, in alphabetical order, these are listed in alphabetical order, is Alduin from Skyrim. Now, if you've seen the video, you would already know, man, this is not my favorite villain, okay? In fact, I think he's a little stinky. So I'm gonna put him in D. Now, I might move these around quite a bit as we populate the little tiers, but initially I'm thinking D. Now, Skyrim is one of the biggest, maybe the biggest video game ever. I mean, everyone knows what it is, right? Next to like Mario Brothers. And it's this RPG with the rich world of Tamriel and all this incredible lore and all these like gods and Daedra and all this shit. And it's so smelly to me that he is the main antagonist of like the vanilla game because I don't know. I, and again, I say this in the video, there's so much interesting stuff surrounding him, the influence for the character with all this like Eastern mythology and the Kalpa ending and him being the world eating serpent and how that ties in with like Norse mythology. There's so much potential there. And all you really get is like an evil, it's like Smaug. He's so base in his villainy that you don't get the interesting stuff that is behind the character in game. And I think most people, all that other stuff kind of flies right past him because it's just not depicted to the player. Um, I think he looks stupid. I think his voice is stupid. And I think given the villains of Elder Scrolls past, I mean, Mankar Cameron, Dagoth Ur, uh, even like the minor antagonists that are within Skyrim, He's just boring. And I, I said this in the video as well, but I think if he was made to be more of like a primal, neutral evil of like, he doesn't even notice any human activity or doesn't really care about the dragonborn. He's just like, well, it's time. I got to end the world now. Time to eat it. 
it would be a lot cooler. Also, he's too small, dude. Like, in-game, he he's the same size as all the other dragons. I feel like he should take up the entire sky and be like, you know, Armageddon. Like, this is Alduin. This is the world leader. It's the end of the world. Overall, man, I think Alduin is just a massive disappointment for me personally because he could have been so cool and he had pretty big legacy to live up to with the previous villains in the series, but not the best. I'm putting him in D. That might change. We'll see. So from one of the worst, we immediately jump to one of the absolute best video game villains ever, in my opinion, in Andrew Ryan. I mean, this guy. This is a masterclass of villainy, how to write it, how to act it, how to depict it, and how to conquer it, ultimately leaving the protagonist questioning his own motivations and his own sense of control. I think he is easily an S-tier video game villain. Because Rapture itself, the entire setting of the game, is like his domain, his castle, his own wonderland that he created for himself and all of his followers. So you get to see firsthand constantly all of the intricacies of what he wanted for this utopia. You see his dream that turned into a nightmare, the lengths that he was willing to go to retain power, the people he abused, the people he killed. I mean, Andrew Ryan is a bona fide psychopath, but one that is so calm and seemingly in control, it makes for a very compelling and sinister presence waiting for you towards the end of the game. Then you have just the iconic interaction with him, the way he talks to you, a man chooses, a slave obeys, bro, get the hell out of here. This guy is S tier and I ain't having nothing else about it. But additionally, his backstory that's really informed by Ayn Rand, the writer of The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, and her real life coming from Russia to the United States, and how Andrew Ryan went from this upstart businessman to this hardened capitalist that was willing to take everything down to the ocean floor, it's just absurd, but it works so well. Man. It's so believable, it's so American. He's such a dick. I love Andrew Ryan. S tier, baby. S tier. So while we're on the topic of excellent S-tier video game villains, why not next talk about Daddy Dagoth Ur, the villain that started it all on this channel, and easily, in my opinion, the best Elder Scrolls villain ever. That's another easy S-tier for me. Dagoth Ur benefits from some of the coolest lore in the history of video games, man. I mean, Michael Kirkbride, who wrote a bunch of the stuff for Morrowind, that dude was on some crazy-ass drugs, and that's verifiably true. But I think something that a lot of villains could benefit from in video games is interpretive lore. And that's something Morrowind is full of. So with Dagoth's backstory, there's all these different accounts of what happened, who was in the wrong, who was in the right, and how he kind of tumbled into being this forgotten, insane god inside of a volcano. He also has a history going back millennia. Connections to Nerevar, all of the members of the tribunal. I mean, this dude is representative of all of the history of one of the oldest regions of Tamriel, period. And to see that all in one character who is villainous and trying to build this, like, organic golem and spread corpus and dominate all of Morrowind. It's just, it's so fascinating. It's so psychedelic and odd, and he's so charming. He's so cool with his mask. Then the fact that your player character is the Nerevarin, and thus the reincarnation of his once friend Nerevar, makes this encounter have sort of like a somber undertone to it, where he sees his old friend and he's welcoming him back again, but you're there to kill him and end his plans. My only real gripe here is that there's no way to join up with Dagoth if you find him charming and kinda hate the tribunal, because the more you play Morrowind, the more you realize those three characters are pretty devious bastards themselves, and it would be so fun to be able to join the sixth house and have this sort of optional end game where you topple them. But ultimately, this dude is just so absurdly iconic. I mean, Dagoth Wave, the Young Scrolls song, all the AI memes of the last like six months, he is Morrowind for so many people, and I am one of them. Incredible video game villain. And I'm sorry to say, it seems the Elder Scrolls big bad guys has been downhill since Dagoth. So next we have Dark Link. Now this one is fascinating, a very difficult character to kind of pin down and an even more difficult villain to kind of pin down. I mean, in the video we talked about how he's really not even a character, right? He's just representative of the darkness within Link, within the hero, which is very sick and it, it's a great backbone for a villainous presence, but I wouldn't say it's the strongest foundation for a villain. Because a villain, I mean, I want to see like a plot, a scheme, 
uh, fascinating backstory toward evil, like all these things that justify their position as a villain and as an antagonist where Dark Link is really kind of always been this side thing. It's never, he's never the main bad guy who's trying to take over the world or something. That's Ganon's territory. So I think I want to put him in C, but he is super iconic and the, the fight in Ocarina of Time especially is like, that's the thing I think a lot of people think of when they remember that game, maybe over the final Ganon fight even. But still, I mean, as a villain, he's just not quite there. I might even drop him down to D. I'll keep him, I'll keep Alduin ahead of him because Alduin is the main villain of a game with a bunch of backstory. But I just think Dark Link, as a video game villain, kind of falls short. But that doesn't mean he isn't cool and he isn't like a big part of those games and the mythos of those games. It just feels like he's more a part of Link, Link's journey, Link's world, Link's life than anything that stands on his own. So I gotta drop him down a little bit for that. So next up, it is Frank the Tank, Horrigan, from the most recent Villainpedia episode. Famous from Fallout 2, one of the hardest endgame bosses in all of Fallout. I love this guy, man. I think he is so sick. Ugh. Love his backstory, love his presence, love his voice. Everything is so strong. However, I don't think he's the best villain. Because at the end of the day, as we covered in that video... The Enclave and the President and all the brains behind what they are doing in that game as far as antagonism and the things that you have to stop, Frank is just like the Frankenstein monster of that. I mean, he's no mastermind of anything. I don't think the President's like, hey, Frank, what do you think? A dude is just there to follow orders and crush people. Huh. <sighs> this is tough. I think I'm going to put him in C, but the fight at the end and... Just how, like, feared he is in the lore of the Wasteland and then the legacy he leaves after. I'm actually going to toss him up to B. Maybe we'll move him down. Probably not. I think B is fair. I really like Frank Horrigan. I think the backstory is underrated. And yeah, he just follows orders and he's kind of a thrall. But he is one of one when it comes to Fallout lore. And I think you got to give him that. Not to mention Frank is, like, really fucking evil. I mean, it's pretty terrifying to have this Hulk, essentially, who will do anything he's told. I bet if they asked him to crush his mom's skull, he'd be like, okay, for the Enclave, USA, baby. Like, he doesn't give a fuck. And that is a huge part of his presence, which I think is absurdly villainous. So next we have GLaDOS, who... Honestly, I might say is the best villain I have ever made a video on, period. It's also my longest video. It's like an hour and 20 minutes or some shit. It's very long. But GLaDOS, I would say, is narratively and gameplay-wise perfect. So easy, easy S tier. As easy as the others too, if not easier. And I'm even going to slide her all the way to the front. My favorite villain, I think, ever is GLaDOS as of right now maybe there's maybe I'm tripping and I'm just saying that but she is so goddamn funny I mean the writing and the voice acting performance behind this character spectacular one of my favorite lines in the entire game is look we both said a lot of things that you're going to regret and that is just like the perfect little representation of how snarky how kind of petty she is but also how in control and sinister and evil as well but I think the real shining star here with GLaDOS is the backstory. This woman who was an assistant to this egomaniacal scientific businessman being shoved into a computer and thus losing her humanity, being forced to test and test and test really until the computer shuts off. You feel for GLaDOS as much as you hate her and want to get out of that cycle. I think it's genius and it's such an excellent way to kind of make you think like, Jesus, what am I doing? Every video game is essentially this. I'm just a little rat in the maze completing little tasks and then it's over and I get a slice of cake, let's say. So GLaDOS directly comments on that entire structure. Definitely an all-time great video game character and, in my opinion, one of the best villains in any form of media ever that I've ever encountered. So now we are looking at Jack of Blades from Fable 1. Now this guy is a classic dude and definitely has like a very soft little spot in my heart where he lives forever, but I want to try to separate that. Um, well, Fable itself is like a very traditional game, you know, it, it's like a little fairy tale, it's very simple, but I do think that within Fable 1, Jack of Blades is amazing. Like, 
you really feel that he's this great hero and the way that people talk about him. And then when you first see him in the arena and you hear the voice and then he comes and talks to you about your mom being a hero, all this really, he's so like, you don't really know what he is until it's too late. And then as simple as the narrative is, he really takes over in the latter stages and becomes this massive villain that was always kind of right around the corner which I think is really cool. I think visually he looks incredible. The whole mask aesthetic, I think his voice, the original voice and the remade voice are both really, really cool in their own way. I think it's really cool how he is the one responsible in truth for your parents being killed in the beginning of the game when you're just a little kid. So then you have the entire path of the game to finally reach him and conquer that, which gives a nice little like bookend to the entire experience. I also think the whole morality system within Fable 1 lets Jack of Blades be more than just a kind of villain, which is what he is, because you get to choose if you want to be a more hero or a more villain type character as the protagonist. So if you're the villain, you kind of feel like you're claiming Jack's role and becoming the new monster. And if you're a hero, it feels like you're conquering him and moving on, which, I don't know, it gives him a malleability and another little interesting kind of element there that I really appreciate, especially in Fable. I'm a big fan of the series. So I think I am going to place Jack of Blades in A. I think for what he is asked to do in Fable 1, he does it perfectly. There's been two other games since then, but, well, other ones too, but we don't talk about those, dude. But I think from the main three Fable games, he's definitely the most iconic villain, the one that everyone would want to see make some sort of comeback in the new Fable. I don't know about that, but I think for anyone studying, like, basic storytelling, and especially in this kind of setting in a video game where it's interactive, Jack of Blades is a wonderful little role model. I mean, he's very simple, but he fulfills his role to a T. Love Jack of Blades. So that brings us now to Knight Lautrec from Dark Souls 1, which is very interesting. So we've talked about in all the Souls videos how morality in general is really hard to pin on characters in that series, and really in From Software games at large. Things are often left so purposely ambiguous, and you don't really even know if you're in the right by killing all these ancient gods and resetting the world and all that kind of jazz, but Lautrec is pretty sinister. I mean, even the way that his voice is and the fact that he kills the Firekeeper under Firelink Shrine, which just directly kind of slows your progress down and then you have to go seek him out and put him to rest to reset things, he definitely has an antagonistic presence, but he is, in truth, a very minor character, right? I mean, even Gwyn, who's like the last boss, it's debatable if he's a villain. So, with Lautrec, I mean, he's more of an inconvenience, I would say. And his backstory, though it is incredibly interpretive, could even be seen from a certain lens as him being a hero. So I want to be careful here with this guy. I mean, there are times I even regret putting him in the Villainpedia, if I'm honest. But I think he does enough where he needs to be stopped for you to progress the game. And he is kind of like fucking around a lot. He's a deviant, you know? Um, and in my initial video, I called him a snake in a Gucci slide, which I just think is funny because he looks so swagged out in the armor. And I think it's so cool how the armor is so like contrary to the way he behaves. Like he looks like this noble knight with the embrace armor. Like maybe he's a loving guy and he turns out to just be kind of a scoundrel from our perspective. I don't know. I, cause I feel weird putting him above dark link. I'm, I think I'm going to move Dark Link up and put Lautrec behind him. I think that's a fair move. Um, Lautrec is just so unique, and I think the voice acting is really nice. It drips with evil, but he just doesn't do enough to really be considered a true villain, like a main villain. And I'm going to keep him above Alduin because of the just sheer disappointment of Alduin. I mean, that's a whole other beast together. But yeah, I think Lautrec C behind Dark Link, that feels good. I, I can sleep with a smile on my face. So holy smokes, it's now time for the Lich King. Uh, what a character, right? I mean, when it comes to video game villains, I would say Arthas, out of all of these guys, might be the most well-known just in popular culture, like the average boob on the street. Eh, maybe Barry and Waluigi, actually. But the Lich King is almost bigger than Warcraft, which is crazy because Warcraft is so big. I mean, the story began so long ago with Warcraft 3 and Arthas's fall to becoming the Lich King. I mean, it's just fucking epic, dude. It's kind of like Anakin Darth Vader, but 
I kind of think it might even be better. It's the Lich King. I mean, this is, I guess, combined, the Arthas video and the Lich King video. I think I made almost two hours of content there for that character alone. There's so much incredible backstory. These little things that happen that lead Arthas down that dark path. And then once he's on that dark path, it just continues to get worse. But add in that there's all this crazy shit with Ner'zhul, who's like this ancient orc who really is the Lich King, and he's trapped in the sword and then the helmet. The Helm of Domination is then this whole, like, relic that then can turn someone else into the Lich King. It's just, yeah, Epic doesn't even begin to describe it. I think the scale alone of Arthas and the Lich King puts it in A, at the top of A, and then the execution and the height of World of Warcraft, which is one of the biggest games in the history of Earth, being surrounded by Arthas and Northrend and all of those storylines. And then really, in my opinion, the best RTS campaign game of all time, Warcraft 3, being that's like the main thing you're dealing with and learning about. Uh, there's just few better. I'm going to put them in S. Um, I, oh, man, that's hard. I don't know. I might put damn i might switch up s really quick i think i'm gonna put andrew ryan there he's spectacular don't get me wrong man just but the lich king oh my god it, i don't like him more than dagoth i think dagoth is more nuanced and kind of interpretive which i like as i said and glados is glados but I mean, this is one of the pillars of video game villainy and probably always will be forever. And my only regret here with Arthas and the Lich King is that this was not the focus of the Warcraft movie, which I also made a video on. Check it out. Check it out. But this story is just so beautiful and it's so well told within the games. I think it needs to be respected, aka Modern Blizzard needs to stay the hell away from this thing. And it also needs to be told on a grander scale because, man, the world is ready for that. But that's really just the story, man. I mean, it's very unique that you have this main villain from this massive franchise and you get to play as him before and after he becomes that character in Warcraft 3. I mean, that is just so cool to me. And then he ultimately becomes the ultimate, like, raid boss in World of Warcraft in Ice Crown Citadel, which was a very challenging, very memorable boss fight with one of the best cinematics after you kill him. And he's also the subject of, I think, the best video game cinematic ever when the Wrath of the Lich King was first announced. Iconic doesn't even begin to describe it. Perfectly executed. We love this guy, man. We really do. That brings us now to, in my opinion, one of the most underrated video game villains ever in Mankar Cameron, who is kind of like the secondary antagonist from the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, which just so happens to be my favorite game in the Elder Scrolls series. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of slap him in A, and I'm even going to place him above Jack of Blades. Because Mankar Cameron is like a very familiar villainous archetype. He's an ancient elven wizard, he's a cult leader. I mean, we've seen others like him in the past in other big games, but I think the way a character like that functions within the Elder Scrolls universe with the Deidre being these like kind of weird, twisted, demon-like gods and Merun's Dagon being the focus of this cult that Mankar Cameron starts and then ultimately he comes into the world and starts crushing everything regardless of what you do during the quest. There's something very appealing to me about him, about his little British accent. Terrence Stamp is the actor who plays him, and it's just, he's such a prick, man. You cannot wait to crush this fool's skull. I especially love when you go to Paradise, which is like a little slice of oblivion that Mankar Cameron is gifted, and he's talking shit to you the entire time you're getting closer to him telling you all of his crazy ass conspiracy theories about Lorcan being a Daedric prince and Mundus being his realm of oblivion. It's just like, dude, this is crazy. This is bullshit. I'm going to come kill you. He's got some freaky ass kids. He's just super memorable. And I mean, listen, I'm definitely biased. Oblivion is my game, man. I have played it so many times. It's so familiar to me. I just love this guy. I think he's dreadfully underrated and definitely deserves a spot in the A tier. So now we have our final Elder Scrolls villain here, and it is Mirak from the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's expansion pack called Dragonborn. Now this dude is kind of like Alduin in that he just disappoints me, dude. So much missed potential with this character. So I think, just to start, I'm throwing him in C, low C tier. I mean... The backstory is so cool. It's so promising. He was like this ancient 
dragon priest in the Marithic era, which is like primordial times when dragons still rule over the world. And then he realized he could kill the dragons and eat their souls. So he started doing that. But then he gets stuck in Apocrypha, which is Hermaeus Mora's realm of oblivion. And he's kind of just in stasis, not aging. And then when we come along, he's starting to get his way out of Apocrypha into the real world. And he wants power back. I mean, he really is the first Dragonborn, and we are kind of the last Dragonborn, and there is so much potential there narratively for you two having to, like, work together slash against each other to kill Alduin if he was part of the main storyline. But instead, it feels like this tacked-on little side quest with this character who should be way more significant than he is, especially when it comes to being a villain. He just doesn't really feel like a villain. He kind of just feels like a bitter dick who's like like still rocking the shoes from the 80s and thinks he's hot shit it's like bro <laughs> times have moved on without you homie like i don't need you so you just like whoop his ass and then go back out into the normal world with all of his armor it just feels like why did that even happen and it should have been part of the main quest it's just yeah mirak is so bizarre i wish i liked him more but i kind of just don't now i gotta say putting patches in the villainpedia might be my biggest regret on this channel to date because as time went on and i kind of hammered out what the series was about and made the npcpedia i realized that he's more of an npc than he is a villain even though he does shit to mess with you in all of the souls games and even beyond the souls games we all know patches is in elden ring now but that doesn't mean he isn't an antagonist his whole shtick of tricking you into going to look for treasure kicking you into holes trapping you in dangerous places the dude is trying to kill you while you're attempting to progress through some of the hardest games ever made right but I think when you look at the full scope and scale of his implementation into all these games, he's more of like a neutral, like chaotic presence where all he's trying to do is survive from his perspective. He isn't specifically looking to fuck over you. I guess he's just trying to fuck over whoever is there. So I think as a villain, man, he's effective, right? Like you definitely, every time you see him, you're like, ah, oh, here we go. But I don't think... He's just not really a villain, man. I would put him in the same kind of zone, I think, as Lawtrek here in C. Because the character is so strong, and he is so iconic of, like, bad things that could happen to you in the Dark Souls game. And he kind of teaches you those lessons as the player. So he's representative of villainous shit, but he himself isn't, like, I mean, he's no Frank Horrigan, right? He's no Jack of Blades. I don't even think he's a Dark Link. But I think right here is a nice little sweet spot. He's just a little goblin of a man who's trying to get by. And we all love him. But you also love to hate him. So maybe he's a villain after all. I don't know. I'm always thinking about this kind of stuff. So let me know what you think down below. Is Patches really a villain? Would you put him higher or lower? I don't know. <laughs> okay, next is Skull Kid from Majora's Mask. Which I also think is a fascinating one, man. Hmm. I mean, I think just the presence and appearance alone, you know, the little laugh, the childlike trickster energy, he's very much like a jester, which you all know I like. All of that already puts him in B. I mean, he is insanely memorable. Majora's Mask, just like the iconography of that, might even put him instantly above Frank. And then I think once you look into the backstory and the kind of tragedy of Skull Kid and him just being this little forest nymph dude who got this mask put on him, it's, it's so, like, dark for a game like that. It's so bizarre. And the fact that he's pulling the moon to come destroy the world and how that affects the game mechanics. I mean, talk about a villain and the unique aspects of that villain dictating the entire game's design and the way that you play it. I think he's A. I really do. I think S Skull Kid, man, I, I would even put him above Jack. I think Skull Kid is absolutely fantastic. And one of my favorite things about him is that they never brought Dude back, right? I mean, he was so popular and that game was so popular, they could have milked that shit and like brought Skull Kid in like a little dungeon in Twilight Princess or something and just, you know, but they never did. They really left that alone. And I think that makes it even more strange and kind of dark and this like one-off thing that's stuck in the N64 graphical style. But yeah, easily, easily my favorite Zelda villain and probably my favorite Nintendo villain, I think. I mean, I can't think of someone with a more unique and impactful appearance like Skull Kid. So now we have our first kind of purely goofy villain, and that is the Devil from Cuphead. I think this was the second Villainpedia ever. It's like five minutes long. It's not the best, but 
I really love the game Cuphead, and I think the devil acts as like a really fun antagonist that's super simple. He's such a scoundrel, smoking cigars, stealing souls, gambling and shit. He's just like a gangster, man. I really like him. And I think for Cuphead being such a simple game narratively, he does his thing perfectly. I'm gonna stick him in B. I think he's extremely effective. He's like an old cartoon bad guy where, I mean, he doesn't really feel that threatening. But if you know anything about Cuphead, you know it's hard as shit. And all those bosses leading up to the devil are increasingly difficult. So then when you finally fight him and that encounter takes place, it really does feel epic. And like, damn, this is it. Gotta get me and my boy's souls back. It's also just novel and funny that this cutesy hand-drawn game, the main antagonist, is straight up the devil. Like... I love that shit, man. It's ridiculous. And when it comes to an embodiment of evil, I mean, the devil's very effective. He's got his pointy horns, his little henchman. He offers you a contract if you want to just give up. I love the simplicity. I love the art, of course. And yeah, I think the devil's great, man. How can you not love him? Okay, next up, we have a big one. And that is the master from Fallout 1. This is the most watched Villainpedia episode by far with over a million and a half views. And dude... He is fantastic. Easily S tier. I mean, in this category with these titans, no doubt about it. The writing, the voice, the appearance, plan to make everyone into mutants so that people don't fight with each other. Absolutely alarmingly good and very convincing as a villain. Like, once you hear his plan, you're kind of like, shit, yeah, that would solve a lot of the Wasteland's problems. I also think Homie has an incredible backstory. I mean, this doctor, like, tragically falling into this big vat of goo and then slowly and painfully mutating into this thing that's like a computer man flesh ball. It's so science fiction. It's so Fallout. And it's so, like, horrifying but intriguing. I will say, though, I think the speech option, which is legendary at this point, that you can kind of tell him his plan is flawed and then he blows himself up, is a little silly because, well, it's about his super mutants being sterile, which is something that he probably could have fixed with more science and more experiments, but he just kind of cops out. And that is the only thing I think keeps him behind these other villains who many of them see their plans through to the end or close or they're so far down another path. But the master, absolutely S-tier. I think definitely the best Fallout antagonist ever, never will be surpassed. And if Fallout wants to kind of retrieve some of that core Fallout feel from the older games, they need to start with their villains, bro, because it's crazy how it's only been downhill from Fallout 1. Go back to the blueprint of the Master. This is what it's all about. Now we come at last to Tom Nook. Thomas Nookington, the Tanooki, Animal Crossing's villainous debt collector and landowner. So, in all honesty, when I made this video, it was kind of a joke, but also legitimately not. So, Tom Nook is, I guess, not a villain, but he represents the thing you're working against in Animal Crossing, which is always crippling debt. Something that as a young adult I'm all too familiar with, and it's, quite frankly, horrifying and very villainous. But I don't think we can really put him in a tier with characters like Dark Link and Patches, so I'm gonna throw him in D. Because I do think that he has a very memorable antagonistic presence as far as being that debt collector. And he introduced millions and millions of children to that horrifying concept. But he's also kind of trying to help you out and he's just playing by the rules, man. He's just trying to make a buck. What are you going to be mad at him for? You're doing the same shit on your little island or whatever. I think this is a classic example of great character but not the best villain, right? I mean, everyone knows and loves this guy, but he's not up there with the big guns. It's just a fact. But it might surprise you to learn that a villain I do think belongs up there with the big boys is Edwin Van Cleef from World of Warcraft. In fact, I'm going to stick him right next to Mankar Cameron of Oblivion in A tier. Boldly, with authority, Edwin Van Cleef is incredible, dude. And by far, it's my favorite episode of the Villainpedia that I have made to date. I mean, here we have a blue-collar worker, a stonemason, who is heading the union of all these other craftsmen, chosen by the King of Stormwind to rebuild the city after a huge war with the orcs. They complete the job perfectly, the city's gorgeous, and these boys don't receive a penny in payment. This is, of course, due to the nefarious dealings of this lady who's a dragon and all this stuff within the Stormwind court. But this, in my opinion, of all the villains here listed, is the most justifiable spiral into villainy. 
All they really want is their payment, which they earned fair and square with hard work. But if the crown can't pay up, then yeah, they're gonna go rob the roads and become rogues right outside of the city, sacking travelers and causing danger around Stormwind. Now, I understand that in the grand scale of World of Warcraft, Edwin Van Cleef is a very small character the final boss of an early game alliance dungeon in the Dead Mines. But that dungeon may just be one of the most iconic and one of the most commonly ran dungeons in the history of that game. I mean, as iconic as someone like Ragnaros is, far more players have faced down Edwin Van Cleef, defeated him, and consumed this little story. I just think this dude embodies what it means to be a villain and doing nothing wrong, man. Like they say, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And before Edwin knew it, he was a classic pirate, robbing innocent people and hurting the city that he built. I just love it, man. I think Warcraft these days would do to take notes from this, again, on how to make small-scale villains and little contained stories that just make human sense, you know? Okay, and rounding out this tier list, we got Waluigi and Wario. Now, let's be very frank, boys. These guys ain't really villains. I mean, look at the other characters up here. These are just characters that happen to be like anti-versions of the heroes, Mario and Luigi. But I'm gonna put them both in F tier. Someone has to go in F tier. And I think these are excellent characters. Everyone loves them for different reasons, but they just suck as villains, man. Waluigi especially, get your ass on the bottom, homie. I love you, but the most villainous thing you did was in like the Mario Tennis thing where you and, uh, in a cutscene, you and Wario try to blow something up. I don't remember. Something not good, but when all of your villainy is confined to sports games, cutscenes, yeah, Waluigi, you're rounding out the very bottom, and Wario, you're too lovable to be a villain on this list. I mean, I definitely dislike Tom Nook and Alduin more than you when I'm playing games like this, but I think there is something to be said for just how iconic these guys are, especially Wario. I mean, damn, I kind of want to even put Wario in D, but yeah, I'll put Wario in D. I'm so sorry, Waluigi. You look so sad. You know what? I'm gonna put him back just because I don't want Waluigi to be alone. And they're so similar. Like, yeah, Wario's gotten more screen time over the years, but it's really the same archetype, right? No concrete backstory, no real, like, interesting boss fights. Very few games where you walk away with those characters in your mind solely, except the ones where Wario acts as, like, a protagonist. And I think, overall, the Mario Brothers games are pretty soft on villainy. I mean, even if Bowser was on this list, I might put him in B tier, C tier. It's just, it's so safe, and there's not a ton of lore or interesting motivations other than just basic, like, I want Peach, or whatever. So yeah, I think this is pretty fair. So let's have a little look over here. So we have in S tier, in this order, GLaDOS, Dagoth Ur, the Lich King, Andrew Ryan, and the Master. I think I'm happy with that, but I might move Andrew Ryan to the bottom. Only because of like the Frank Fontaine stuff that kind of takes a little bit away from Andrew Ryan and... I just think the master is so unique and he built the foundation of all this stuff for the Fallout franchise as far as villainy because of all the super mutants, etc. But it's rather close. I think I'm happy with S. Then in A, we have Mancar Cameron at the top, Edwin Van Cleef, Skull Kid, and Jack of Blades. I think that's very strong. I am confident with that. Then going down to B, we have Frank Horrigan and the Devil from Cuphead. Hmm. I think I'm going to switch, yeah, I thought I was going to do this earlier, I'm going to switch Dark Link and the Devil from Cuphead. I think Dark Link is just too, he's too unique in what he represents as this like villainous presence that you feel like could appear in any game at any time, and the Devil is great, but you kind of see what he is from the beginning, and that's what you get, you know? Um, so then in C tier, we have the Devil. The two Dark Souls guys and Mirak, which I think is pretty safe because the two Dark Souls characters I think are just, they're a little more neutral than a villain. Um, and then Mirak is just wasted potential. Then in D we have the ultimate duo, Alduin the World Eater and Tom Nook. Absolutely fantastic tier right here. Uh, just super disappointing and shitty villain i don't like alduin i think he's boring and busted and then tom nook is just he's tom nook he doesn't do enough but he's funny and he adds that kind of mean presence to an otherwise really adorable game he's d and then as we just covered these boys at the bottom this is it okay 
This is the definitive government issued tier list of the Villainpedia season one from the man himself, Ghost Charm. So you know what I want you to do now is I want you to get in the comments, I want you to go click that link, and I want you to fill out one for yourself. You can tweet it at me, you can just write down in the comments instead of filling it out if you want. I want your opinion on these characters, how they stack up against each other. I also want to know what you think the best video in this series has been, what was the weakest video, and most importantly, what is the number one Villainpedia video you want to see come season two? I gotta be honest, this was a very strange video to make because it's usually so much research and labor going into each upload, but it was also kind of relaxing to just sit here in my house and talk. I think I'm starting to see why so many YouTubers kind of just do that. But uh, anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out, just keeping this on. Even if you just skip to the end to see the final rankings, what's up? How are you? I hope you had a nice little day. I have a couple big scale projects on highly requested characters in the works that I think you guys are going to absolutely lose your minds at. And I gotta say, it is an absolute privilege, honor, and joy to do this as a job, to entertain you guys with these videos, my opinion. I love the editing, I love the process of writing these things for you. And again, I cannot thank you enough for being such a positive community. I have been around on the internet since I was a little kid, and I know how rare that is. So thank you, every single one of you. The next time you hear from me, it will be in a normal video with the higher quality and all the bells and whistles you guys have come to expect. But thank you for coming along on this little fun adventure with me. And until next time, peace.